Hey everyone, Sumo Spiffy here. Welcome to this frankly much larger than expected breakdown of Hoshoryu, where we'll compare his 9-6 run in Nagoya 2022 to his 12-3 Yusho at Nagoya 2023. Clearly he's improved. In 2022, he kept racking up 8 and 9 wins, whereas Nagoya 2023 was the end of an Ozeki run where he landed 10, 11, and then 12. But what exactly is different? Has he become a complete wrestler, or are there still holes in his game that need shoring up? Quick note before we start. All clips in this video will be played at half speed. This should make it easier to see what's happening without having to go back and replay parts of the video, although there will be plenty of pauses as necessary. Alright, there's a lot to cover, so let's get into it. Hoshoryu uses his common tactic of touching second so he can spring forward immediately, but this isn't an issue for Ura, who normally stays low and hangs back. Hoshoryu swings his arms out like he's expecting Ura to be there. The only thing near his arms though is Ura's head, and when Ura ducks just a bit, Hoshoryu completely whiffs. It looks like his goal might have been to land high on Ura's shoulders, but he aimed too precisely and it took only a small movement to evade the tactic. The miss lets Ura get his hands inside, which allows him an excellent pushing position, and he drives Hoshoryu straight back to the rope. Hoshoryu braces and, largely through power, gradually detaches Ura's hands from his chest. Then he pushes to rock Ura back and uses that little bit of space to step left and pull Ura down by the arms. This is Hoshoryu winning with a combination of core technique and superior physical ability. Ura can drive a lot of guys out this way, but Hoshoryu showed a clear power advantage once they reached a static position. The start here is kinda ridiculous. Hoshoryu jumps in and makes first contact, but unlike Ura, who got his good position by dodging Hoshoryu's hands, Takakesho just bulldozes through his arms. Hoshoryu is more capable than most of dealing with being bent back like this, but it's still a terrible position. He parries the locked arm, as all wrestlers should, and slides back, but then he tries slapping down Keisho's arms and misses everything. The real problem here isn't that he misses, but that Taka Keisho doesn't even bait him with a feint to draw the slap down attempt. Hoshoryu seems to simply assume the arms will keep coming like pistons, and when they don't, he knocks himself off balance. His balance is still good enough to recover and even get his right hand in for the belt grip, but Takakesho hops back, makes him follow, and uses that mini giant strength to whip Hoshoryu onto his face. Takakesho is a tough fight for Hoshoryu at the best of times, but Hoshoryu kinda did this to himself. This is a longer fight, but there's not that much to really study, especially if you know Ichinojo's general style. Ichinojo steps to his left and smartly gets his right arm inside on the Tachiai. Even if he can't reach all the way down for the belt right away, he's so big that this makes it all the harder for Hoshoryu to reach around and get an effective belt grip of his own. Off this start, Ichinojo clamps Hoshoryu's right arm and tilts his left hip away, making the belt essentially unavailable on that side. On the other, his right hand is far enough in that Hoshoryu is compelled to pinch his left arm in and defend his own belt rather than go for Ichi's. When Hoshoryu shifts his left hand to Ichi's elbow, Ichi adjusts by putting his hand on Hoshoryu's upper chest to push. He's threatening where Hoshoryu's defense allows him to threaten. He doesn't need to find a quick victory, since his style is, or was, to often make opponents deal with his weight for as long as possible. Hoshoryu's not bracing hard with the left hand though, so Ichi slips his right back in towards the belt. Hoshoryu reaches up the arm now, which Ichinojo takes as an opportunity to really attack the belt. Hoshoryu uses his grip on Ichi's upper right arm and around his back on the other side to step and pull, but now it just looks like he's not sure what to do. He gets bent low and digs in, which is the position where Ichinojo can start to feel especially heavy. Hoshoryu's basically trapped here. He doesn't have any good angles of assault, so it's just a matter of time until Ichi gets his belt. With the control afforded by the left grip, Ichi presses forward because now it doesn't matter if Hoshoryu matches his grip on that side. Ichi's not going for any techniques that could be countered by the belt grip. He's just pushing and pushing until Hoshoryu goes out. Shodai absorbs the initial contact and steps to his left, pulling his arms out of the way to off-balance Hoshoryu. It works a bit, but not that much. 
Shodai lands a clamp with his right arm, although not a great one, and pushes up on Hoshoryu's chest with his left. Hoshoryu swipes down on the left, but Shodai releases again. Shodai gets his arms inside now, but all this maneuvering has given Hoshoryu a clean right grip on the belt. Shodai pushes Hoshoryu back, then goes in reverse and pulls when Hoshoryu braces to stop the push, but Shodai ran up on Hoshoryu so much that Hoshoryu got a left hand grip as well. This isn't an easy position for Hoshoryu to maintain, but it's still pretty good for him. Shodai, to his credit, tries to take advantage of this by stepping back with his right foot to wheel Hoshoryu into a throw. He gets his left knee solidly inside of Hoshoryu's right, but Hoshoryu wisely releases his left hand from Shodai's belt, which is where part of the throw leverage was coming from. He still gets flung around Shodai's body and slides to the rope, but with his hand free, he's able to catch his balance. With Hoshoryu still bouncing around, Shodai takes several steps left, using his hand wrapped under Hoshoryu's right shoulder to pull him along. But Hoshoryu's able to defend against Shodai's right hand searching for the belt, eventually clamping and trapping it inside as he braces against the rope. Part of the brace, though, is pushing that left hand on Shodai's chest, which loosens the clamp. Shodai pulls the hand free to attack with a pushdown, but Hoshoryu reacts very quickly, pushing Shodai just enough to make the attack miss. From an equal stand-up position, Hoshoryu frankly shows his superior ability by getting a side position quickly and total control of Shodai's left arm with it. Shodai has to pivot and pull his left foot way back to free his arm. Look at how close he is to stepping out. Plenty of guys with their toes on the Tawara would hit the sand with their heel and lose here, but Shodai's managed to counter by clinging to Hoshoryu's left arm, pulling it in, and using that to get himself off the rope. From another neutral stand-up position, Hoshoryu nearly gets Shodai's left arm again almost immediately. Shodai pulls it free, but then he's just standing face up with Hoshoryu and begging to get drilled. Hoshoryu obliges, but whether intended or not, it's a trap. Shodai takes the contact, then steps back and pulls on the arms just enough to get Hoshoryu to faceplant onto the clay. To be fair to Shodai, this was his third consecutive win against Hoshoryu, but this was really Shodai's power against Hoshoryu's superior tactics, and the tactics were winning most of the way. It's hard to see what else Hoshoryu could have done, since he kept finding good positions when he wasn't getting ragdolled. Sometimes sumo matches just get wild, and we end up with finishes like this. This one's interesting for the ways that things sometimes go wrong. Hoshoryu comes in and instantly reaches for the belt. He doesn't get it though, so he wraps his left arm around Waka's right to defend. On the other side, he pinches his right arm in to try and control Waka's left. But look at this position. His right arm is basically in the middle of Waka's body and he has, at most, Waka's left wrist. This is an easy position for Waka to escape from, and when he gets that left arm free, Hoshoryu is basically holding on to that right arm with both hands. He tries to get his right arm inside for a belt grip, but Waka's in far too good a position and has no problem defending it. Soon enough, he gets Hoshoryu tipped to the left, even giving him a head nudge, and gives him a good shove once he's just off balance enough for it to work. Hoshoryu still has that excellent balance and recovers his footing at the rope, but Waka's got this one bagged. Hoshoryu's good enough that he can win fights when he makes a mistake, but not two against someone like Waka Prime. At this point, Hoshoryu is 1-4. Like we said at the start, he finishes 9-6, so he goes on a run, and it starts now. Abi does Abi things, being long and choky. At this point in their careers, he's never beaten Hoshoryu, because Hoshoryu understands how to push his balance forward enough to not get hammered back and out. In addition, he doesn't try to stop Abi's hands from landing. Instead, he gets his right hand under Abi's triceps immediately to relieve some of the pressure and look for a parry. When Abi switches hands, we see Hoshoryu try the same thing on the other side, although it's clear even from this angle that his left hand isn't placed as well to reduce pressure and, as such, Abi's getting a huge push in. But this is where Hoshoryu's capacity for functioning while get bent backwards at an angle most people can't even reach without snapping in half becomes Abi's kryptonite. He sits in the pocket until Abi keeps his hand in place too long and is super vulnerable to the parry. Once he hits the parry, he attacks, going after Abi at every angle he sees available. The exact attack doesn't matter. What's important is that he's going forward and Abi's going backwards. Abi can do work when he goes backwards in a controlled fashion, but not like this. 
It may sound like damning with feigned praise to say how sure you showed his ability to execute a strategy against a very predictable wrestler like Abi, but everyone knows Abi does this, and very few can stop it regularly. After a day off when Matakiyumi dropped out due to COVID in his stable, Hoshoryu gets Kiribayama. Hoshoryu launches off the Tachiai, but goes for a quick slap here. It barely touches, designed more as a distraction, but it only gets him to a neutral position where they both have a belt grip. After a moment of stability, Kiri steps in and bumps the inside of Hoshoryu's knee with his own. This is really just a test. There's no throw attempt here, just a quick shot at unbalancing Hoshoryu without risking his own position. Since Kiri gets closer, Hoshoryu retaliates by getting low and reaching further for the belt with his left, but Kiri hasn't given up defense on that side and blocks it. When that doesn't work, Hoshoryu quickly uses his grip to twist and try to off-balance Kiri. Having his arm on the outside is important here because it puts pressure on Kiri's elbow and increases the odds he can push this to a favorable spot. He's able to force Kiri to move, but Kiri doesn't go far before rotating back inside and they hand fight again. Kiri tries more leg trickery, this time stepping around to the outside for a Soto Gake. If you saw him do this to Hokuseiho and thought he pulled that out of the bag just for the big boy, no, this is a technique he likes. Hoshoryu, however, sees it coming and gets his foot out of the way, and they return to the low neutral position. Now they're watching each other rather than actively hand fighting, which isn't common, but also gives an idea of how even this matchup is, where they're both like, okay, what's he gonna do, taking a moment at the same time to figure out a plan. Then we have a real nice series of events to watch. Kiri reaches in, not far enough to reasonably threaten the belt, but as a way to force a reaction. Here's what's important. When Kiri reaches in, he narrows his balance just a little. Earlier in the match, Hoshoryu was able to get Kiri to move by torquing his body to the left. Knowing this, he waits for this moment where Kiri acts, however slightly, and does the same thing. Knowing about where he can get Kiri to go with this tactic, he immediately sticks his foot behind Kiri's ankle for his own Sotogake attempt. Kiri's leg is more locked out, so even though he's able to get his foot up and over, it's not as clean a defense as Hoshoryu's was. Still, it's clean enough that he can put his foot down and maintain his balance. Except he doesn't just put his foot down. He tries to immediately counter-trip Hoshoryu as Hoshoryu is recovering. It's a risky gambit, and when he completely whiffs it, He's the one that's off balance. From there, Hoshoryu's aggression is enough to get Kiri out. Just like with Abi, he didn't use a specific method of pushing Kiri out. He found the moment where his opponent was off balance and vulnerable and just got after him so he couldn't recover. Tamawashi does a pretty good job blunting the impact of Hoshoryu's hands coming up and in on the Tachiai. Combined with a sidestep, he gets a good angle for a moment. It's probably worth noting that the step left is also what Ichi no Joe and Shodai did, so it's possible this was viewed as a way to counter Hoshoryu, at least at this point in time. In any case, Tamawashi's got a good aggressive push game, so his right hand comes up for a big shove. But even though he does make contact, Hoshoryu parries enough on the way in to blunt the force. After that, they both push, but Tamawashi's the one going backwards. As Hoshoryu comes in, Tamawashi gets a great parry on his right arm and counters with his own right hand of the face. But Hoshoryu parries that as well, and he's just too strong. This is another combo of core technique and physical prowess. He has enough strength to match up with Tamawashi, but the hand speed Hoshoryu shows in being able to parry the incoming right while getting his own push going puts him over the top here. I like this Tachiai because Kotonowaka knows what's coming and jumps the gun just slightly to prevent Hoshoryu from getting a momentum advantage. Anyway, Koto pushes with his right but brings his left arm in defensively. His hand goes low enough that it looks like he might have considered a belt grab, but he never really goes for it. Hoshoryu responds to this immediately by stepping right, away from the attacking hand, and towards the one he's now over the top of. He gets the belt with his right hand, planting his right foot and attempting to use the momentum he's built to twist Kodo into a throw. His right leg is planted, but it's not directly against Kodo's left leg. If he can pull Kodo into his knee, he should land a good trip, but it's a risky play. And it doesn't work, as Kodo steps in with his left and essentially straddles Hoshoryu's right leg. 
Hoshoryu jams his leg in against Kodo's thigh and tries to basically power him into a throw. That goes nowhere though, and Hoshoryu immediately shifts defensive, grabbing Kodo's wrist before he can make any attacks with that hand. This is like watching a bouncer keep a drunk from punching anyone. Kodo decides he can't win that fight, so he reaches right down the middle, which sounds bad when I say it that way, and Hoshoryu pinches his left arm in to defend. We can't see it here, but Kota Nawaka does manage to get the front of the belt. Somewhat incredibly, Hoshoryu's maintained the right hand belt grip through all of this, so they each have a grip, but it's not an equivalent position. Sometimes we see guys make obvious shifts in their position to set up a move, but Hoshoryu does almost nothing here, just a slight movement of the right foot to the inside. It looks more like he lulls Kota Nawaka to sleep before going for the same throw as before, only with better leg placement. Kodo tries to use the same defense of getting his left foot down on the outside of Hoshoryu's right, but his foot never gets planted, so he's never steady enough to prevent the throw. He probably could have also defended by letting go of the belt and removing that part of Hoshoryu's leverage, like Hoshoryu did against Shodai, but it's really hard to put multiple defensive ideas to work in the literal one second between the start of an opponent's attack and when you're too far off balance to stop what's coming. Between this and the Kiri fight, we see a facet of any high-level martial art, attacking purely as a test to see how the opponent defends it or how able they are to defend it, and use that to set up a better version of the same attack if it appears they're vulnerable to it. Hoshoryu's pretty good at this. Hoshoryu goes for what I've started thinking of as a hanka grab, a clear sidestep to avoid as much initial contact as possible, but with the intent of getting the opponent's belt, not just dodge him. It works like a charm, except for the fact Haru is a couple inches taller and can overcome the ploy just by reaching out and getting his own belt grip. Hoshoryu smartly hops around to the left to give himself more room to play with before trying to attack with his right hand, but Teru gets that mega paw around his upper arm and doesn't let him do anything. To make things worse for Hoshoryu, even though we can't see it at this angle, he doesn't have Teru's belt anymore, so he's trying to battle the kaiju hand to hand on both sides. He backs up since mobility is his obvious advantage. When Teru follows, he uses that moment where Teru is off the ground and at minimum stability to parry the right arm and get Teru twisted away from him, allowing himself a chance to dodge around and get his left hand back on the belt. It doesn't work as Teru jacks him up with a forearm to the chin, but Hoshoryu's circling footwork means his momentum carries him along the rope, not out of the ring. Now they're facing each other down, which is absolutely fine with Terano Fuji. Hoshoryu re-engages, attempting to take advantage of the reaching left while the right hand is still way back and not an immediate threat. However, as he circles, we see Teru's got the underhand belt grip, and it's hard to see what Hoshoryu can do from here. As it turns out, there's something which was very difficult to see in real time because of the Gyoji. As Hoshoryu maneuvers right, and Teru pivots to maintain the balance, Hoshoryu swipes his right leg behind Teru's ankle for a Sotogake. With Teru being so heavy on his feet, getting just enough oomph behind the trip is enough to send him staggering back. But Teru has just enough space to catch himself, using his belt grip to treat Hoshoryu as an additional counterbalance. Hoshoryu dives in, pushes, immediately recognizes that's not going to get him anywhere, and steps back to fling Teru back to the center of the ring. Again, Teru's grip lets him use Hoshoryu's weight to keep from going very far, but Hoshoryu just keeps spinning to force Teru to do exactly what he doesn't want to do, move. It's Shades of Tobizaru from this past July, or perhaps more accurately, we see shades of this fight in what Tobizaru did. Teru is a whole lot of kaiju to swing around though. Hoshoryu runs out of gas, goes for another trip that does little, and they're back to a neutral position. Hoshoryu tries another step back and swing, but Teru defends this much more easily. Teru sits in a defensive stance for a while, slowly working into a position where he can guide the exhausted Hoshoryu out. Hoshoryu came in with a clear plan and executed to the best of his ability, but Teru is just a giant roadblock to the way he fights. This is as Hokuto Fuji a match as you're gonna see. He comes in pushing, and when Hoshoryu pushes him back, he goes for a quick parry on the right arm to open Hoshoryu up for more pushing. 
Hokuto Fuji, however, has a bad habit of swinging his arms around to launch his attacks, which makes him vulnerable to someone like Hoshoryu, who comes directly forward and thus inevitably lands his push first. Since it's Hokuto Fuji, of course, it makes sense for Hoshoryu to attempt a pull-down, but he slips and Hokuto Fuji catches his balance in what looks to be a pretty favorable position. Now Hokuto Fuji just tries to find the right push. His left hand is up, but he pulls it back to control Hoshoryu's right and pushes with his own right instead. Hoshoryu, however, is better than most at trusting his opponent will do what he expects and lands a parry before the full push can even land. Hokuto Fuji recovers to push again, but now Hoshoryu's left hand is on the belt, and when your opponent is this big and aggressive, getting him spun around becomes easier. From here, Hoshoryu wins by Uatanage, but he could have found a dozen different winning moves depending on exactly what Hokuto Fuji did. Like with Abi, Hoshoryu shows a good capacity for dealing with relatively predictable opponents. I broke down Hoshoryu and Wakamoto Haru's Makauchi fights, of which this was the first, in preparation for Day 14 of the Nagoya 2023 Basho. What it essentially comes down to is this. Hoshoryu found Waka very vulnerable to getting tripped up and thrown to the open side. Hoshoryu charges in, can very obviously get a belt grab, but instead clamps the arm, plants his right leg perfectly to the inside of Waka's left, and even though the throw isn't completely clean, Waka's too far off balance to hold on. Waka's made strides in the matchup by working on his defense against the Kotenage specifically, which has been helped by Hoshoryu's insistence on using it. It's the flip side of Hoshoryu being willing to act automatically when he has a good read on someone's style. If they learn how to counter his strategy, it's difficult to adjust in the moment. That's doubly true if Hoshoryu's strategy is something like a Kotanage, which leaves a wrestler in a terrible position if it fails. But in this fight, they hadn't faced each other in two years, so it worked like a charm. Not a lot to say about this one. Tochi Notion was Maegashira 8 East, but this was the tournament with all the COVID dropouts, so on day 14 he was the next guy in line for Hoshoryu to face. Hoshoryu almost instantly gets the belt on both sides, and even though Tochi does what he can to try to lock down defensively, Hoshoryu's too strong in that position and Tochi's knees are too busted up for him not to get yanked out of the ring. This one was really interesting going in. Midori had won all three of their matches, but they hadn't met in over a year, and Hoshoryu was considered the clearly superior wrestler overall. Like Kota Nawaka, Midori knows Hoshoryu's timing and jumps the gun just enough to meet him rather than get crashed into. Hoshoryu knows as well as anyone that Midori likes to use a lot of funky throws and arm yanks, so rather than try to overpower him, Hoshoryu clamps Midori's right arm and hits the step back. When his feet plant, he's clearly trying to hit a pull-down twist to his right, but Midori's got the quicker feet. By the time Hoshoryu's planted, Midori's in a rock-solid parallel stance. With Hoshoryu moving backwards, Midori takes the opportunity to drive forward and not let him recover. Hoshoryu keeps pushing the head down, and Midori's going down, but Midori's got him locked up enough around the body to make him hit the clay about one frame earlier. Hoshoryu's turned things around against Midori in a major way, and it's unlikely we'll see many Midori wins going forward, but at this point Hoshoryu was still figuring out a functional game plan in this matchup. This was not it. Alright, looking over Nagoya 22, this is what we've got. 9 wins. 3 wins where he executed a clean strategy against a known opponent. 2 wins where he tested an attack, then broke out a better version to finish the match. Two wins where he wasn't particularly challenged. One win where he definitely made a mistake but won through physical superiority. And one Fusen. Six losses. Three losses with technical and or strategic blunders. One loss without a clear error but was maneuvered into a losing position. One loss using good strategy but beaten by a simply superior opponent. And one loss that could have easily been a win but that's sumo. Now let's check out Nagoya 2023. Did Hoshoryu reduce his mistakes? Is he even less vulnerable to being outmaneuvered or physically overwhelmed? Is he just luckier? What changed? This Tachiai looks like both guys expected the other to do something different. When Tobizaru's in this kind of double stand-up position, he likes to extend his arms and not overcommit to anything. Hoshoryu's having none of it though, and while not overcommitting either, he comes forward with hands high. 
he doesn't have to push for ground because Tobizaru, trying to stay mobile, gives it up himself. Because he doesn't press, Hoshoryu is minimally affected by Toby's attempted pushdown and pivots into a push for the win. Toby does a terrific job pulling down on Hoshoryu's left forearm, blunting the push and getting Hoshoryu way off balance, but he has to move so fast and so precisely to get out of the way that even he can't stay on his feet. Basically, after the oddball start, Hoshoryu recognized what he needed to do and applied the correct strategy without hesitation. Tobizaru stays at the top of the division because he's a solid wrestler, but also because he's always got some kind of trick in his bag like that forearm pull against tougher opposition. It just wasn't enough this time. Except it was enough, but nobody saw it and they decided not to go to replay. Hoshoryu drills Shodai on the Tachiai, jamming that throat like he's Abi. Hoshoryu sticks his hand to Shodai's face, which should make his arm an easy target for a parry, but Shodai flops his left hand around so much that by the time he actually pushes Hoshoryu's arm, Hoshoryu knows it's coming and shoves Shodai's face just before the parry happens. This keeps Hoshoryu in a centered position where he can easily start pushing again. Shodai tries another parry, and this one lands a little more solidly, but Hoshoryu just lets his arm roll with it and is again not off-balanced at all. Hoshoryu reaches in again as Shodai dodges left, he misses, and this is as off balance as he's been all fight. But this happens in part because of the distance Shodai creates between them, which means Shodai is in no position to take advantage. Hoshoryu simply pivots and drives him out. Even though Hoshoryu is mostly known as a belt guy, he does get into fights where he clearly wants to push his opponent around, and he clearly saw that as a good strategy against Shodai. More importantly, the power differential we saw during their 2022 fight is not at all in evidence here. Before, it was a matter of whether Hoshoryu's skill could overcome Shodai's strength advantage. Now, being more or less on par with Shodai in power, Hoshoryu is able to absolutely manhandle the guy. Hoshoryu gets exactly the Tachiai he wants, driving Nishikigi back by the neck immediately. He sets up a recoil, then releases the neck and pulls on Nishikigi's right elbow to get him stumbling forward. Even though we've seen plenty of guys use this to set up a winning maneuver, that doesn't appear to have been Hoshoryu's goal here. Only pulling on the arm is not going to get anyone on this level to fall down, especially at the start of a fight. Besides that, when he olays Nishi and pushes his back, he pivots into what he expects to be at least a slightly advantageous angle. Nishikigi does a good job rotating and facing Hoshoryu, but his feet are set so wide that he's not out of the woods yet. When Hoshoryu pushes, he rolls with it by dropping his right foot back, and even though Hoshoryu aims just below the neck, Nishikigi swats Hoshoryu's right arm enough to make his hands hit Nishikigi's right shoulder instead. When Hoshoryu gets bent down like this, it's a bad position, but he's recovered from situations like this before. This time, though, his left foot slips and he touches down. Hoshoryu got the better of Nishikigi at the start and worked him into a good position. On this occasion, though, Nishikigi defended well and Hoshoryu got a little unlucky. I wouldn't be surprised if some people think he underestimated Nishikigi, and there's an argument to be made that he launched himself a little too hard into the push where he ended up falling. However, given how absurdly strong Nishikigi is, trying to off-balance him and stay on the push was probably Hoshoryu's smartest strategy, even if he didn't execute perfectly. What's to be said here? Matakiyumi is physically nowhere near Hoshoryu's level anymore. Even if you want to avoid insulting Matakiyumi by saying it was over before the Tachiai, it definitely was over once Hoshoryu got his belt. Since the 2022 fight we watched, Abi managed to bait Hoshoryu into a couple of pushdown wins. This time Abi goes for a delayed Henka, which Hoshoryu is so good against the Henka that I swear guys do it to him as a challenge now. Anyway, if you've watched any videos of wrestlers practicing, they do this thing where one guy pushes on the other's head while the other bounces forward in a squat and follows him around the ring. These two basically do that exercise here. Problem for Abi is that he keeps going back and Hoshoryu stops, so he loses his grip. Abi jumps back into his patented force choke and he lands pretty well, getting Hoshoryu all the way to the rope. Hoshoryu spends the whole slide backwards fighting with Abi's left arm, but only bends back far enough to dislodge it when he hits the rope and stops moving. After that, Abi's momentum takes him down with just a little help from Hoshoryu. This is one where Abi took an unwise approach to the Tachiai, but recovered surprisingly well. 
Hoshoryu's athleticism, and especially his flexibility, matches up well with Abi's style, and again he puts it to good use. It can be hard to tell where skill ends and physical advantage begins, but truth be told, understanding how to maximize your physical advantages is itself a skill, and this is a matchup where Hoshoryu gets to show that off. At this point in their head-to-head, -head, Midori Fuji led 6-3, but Hoshoryu had won three of the last four. He's been figuring out the puzzle. On the Tachiai, Hoshoryu keeps his arms low and inside. He doesn't get the belt, or even go for the belt. He's staying very controlled, effectively letting Midori dictate the action. Midori pushes off and swings his arm around as he dives back in. Hoshoryu, however, reacts mid-swing, getting low on the left side and threatening the belt with his left hand. His right hand comes up to Midori's head though, and he goes for a quick pull, forcing Midori to set his feet and brace. Midori buries his head back into Hoshoryu's chest, looking for another push. Hoshoryu spent the whole fight working with his arms inside to both defend the push and not leave them out far enough to risk being the victim of a Midori throw yet again. Now, however, he allows his right arm to flex out, but only because he's clamping hard on Midori's left. As they rotate, Hoshoryu threatens another push, but only for a moment before getting the clamp back on. He's not taking any risks here. Midori also has a right arm clamp on Hoshoryu's left, but the strength difference makes this an advantage for Hoshoryu. Probably for this reason, Midori releases the clamp and jams his right hand down inside of Hoshoryu's left, but unfortunately, that just leaves Midori clamped on both sides. Midori gets his left knee inside of Hoshoryu's right, off-balancing him slightly, but Hoshoryu's locked in too hard to go very far. This angle, with Midori's back to the camera, shows just what a hopeless position this is for him. Hoshoryu eventually guides him into a trip, but he could have won in any number of ways from that position. This is the kind of win that Hoshoryu has long been capable of taking off Midori Fuji, he just had to figure out how to make it happen consistently. Hoshoryu dives straight in, getting inside with a plan to stay there. Even when he bounces back a bit after initial contact, he drops his head and bulls inside again immediately. Asanoyama tips his left shoulder down to wrap his left forearm around Hoshoryu's right to control it. Hoshoryu can't get much push with the arm in that situation, so instead he gets a huge push down on Asanoyama's clinching arm. He gets a little lucky. Asanoyama's right foot slips back at the same time, and he stumbles harder than he would most of the time. But Asanoyama recovers extremely well, working perfectly well out of the stance he falls into, and immediately shoving Hoshoryu to the rope. This is a pretty even position. A good push is always a threat here, but Asanoyama is only threatening the push, and Hoshoryu's perpendicular stance while braced on the rope allows him to absorb the pressure while also giving him some leeway for footwork. We can't see it from this angle, but Asanoyama has Hoshoryu's belt in his left hand. He uses this to pull up and break Hoshoryu's stance. Hoshoryu's left foot bounces on the rope as he tries to plan his right. There's no strategy here, just survival. Since Asanayama came back though, he's been guilty of trying to force guys out through sheer size and power, leaving himself open to counterattacks in the process. We can see him doing that here, and when Hoshoryu's right foot slides back to the rope to finally stop that big push, Hoshoryu's able to push off of it and step forward with his left, driving Asanayama back. Now they've got belt grips opposite the camera. Asanayama leaves his right arm loose, using his weight alone to semi-clamp Hoshoryu's left forearm. As so often happens with wrestlers who keep that arm dangling though, it gets him in trouble. Hoshoryu is able to snap his left arm free without resistance, which increases the power he's able to generate for his belt throw. This isn't even about technique, this is a straight up power move. Any of us could be injected with Hoshoryu's skill, try this on Asanayama and not budge him. Asanayama manages to hop directly onto the rope, which keeps Hoshoryu from using the momentum to shove him out, but Hoshoryu immediately adjusts before Asanayama can catch his balance by turning and dragging him the other way. What a lot of us may forget is that Asanayama caught up here and just about achieved a defensible position, but he also loses the belt grip he hung on with in the process. Hoshoryu has a much easier time with the second throw attempt, and down goes the Exozeki. As we found out later, of course, Asanayama tore his biceps hanging on during the first throw, which is a big reason why he had no defense at the end. It can be tempting to take the fact Hoshoryu literally tore a guy's arm with a common throw and marvel at his power, but don't forget, Asanayama helped put himself in that position by not clamping Hoshoryu's left arm, 
and allowing him to build more torque on the throw than otherwise would be the case. He f***ed around and he absolutely found out. <laughs> There's not much here. After initial contact, they both step left. Ura waves his arms out but misses completely, leaving the two of them disconnected as Ura steps past and pivots. Hoshoryu chases and pushes on his head, or his knees don't flex as much as they need to, his feet pop out from under him, and down he goes. This is simply a very difficult fight for Ur these days. It could go 20 different ways and still end up with him on the ground 19 times. At full speed, it looks like these guys crash about equally on the Tachiai, but Hoshoryu absolutely beats Hiro Umi to the punch here. Somewhere along the line in Hiro Umi's development, the reverse gear in his transmission broke, so like always, he grinds forward as best he can. He seems to get a decent inside parry off here, pushing Hoshoryu's right arm out and away, but Hoshoryu just rolls with it and brings the arm around and up to grasp Hiro Umi's triceps. Hiro Umi creeps forward, changing his body angle to slowly work inside and make Hoshoryu slowly give up space. Problem is, as we see here, this was all a setup. Hoshoryu steps back more fully and pulls down on Hiro Umi's arms, sliding just far enough aside to get out from in front of Hirado and give him a good shove in the back. Hoshoryu's become very good at this, by the way. He has the strength to hold an opponent off who's putting everything into a forward push and the mobility to get out of the way without turning his whole body to the side. This keeps him close and in good position with a minimum of movement necessary to face his opponent, and here he has a clearly superior position, ready to attack as Hirado is still recovering from the overstep. To Hirado Umi's credit, he lands a palm directly to Hoshoryu's upper chest that Hoshoryu never sees coming. Hoshoryu gets jacked backwards, but reacts by getting both hands on Hirado Umi's right arm and completely controlling it. Now, Hirado Umi has a lot of good qualities, but his biggest weakness might be that he doesn't have the game to deal with opponents who have clear physical superiority over him, and that's what he runs into here. He bulls forward again, trying to move Hoshoryu with an energetic sumo hop, but with his right arm completely locked down, he doesn't have an effective push. He tries pushing up with his left arm, but Hoshoryu uses that moment to step back with his left foot, hook his right leg deep under Hirado Umi's knee, and throw. Hiro Umi resists as best he can, but Hoshoryu's leg is in a position it's never going to relinquish, and Hirado can't prevent himself from getting bounced to the rope and out. It's not quite correct to say Hoshoryu handled this with no issues, since that shot to the chest was legit, but it looked closer than it was because Hiro Umi never ever stops coming. That makes it sometimes seem like he'll find a way to win, but apart from that one moment, which Hoshoryu recovered from well, Hiro Umi never had a real advantage. Like the 2022 fight we saw, Kotonawaka is ready for Hoshoryu's Tachiai timing and rises just before Hoshoryu touches down. He absorbs Hoshoryu's charge, but this time they stay centered rather than rotate. In fact, Kotonawaka is being pretty aggressive even if it's not that obvious. They're locked up on the other side, and Hoshoryu doesn't want his right arm loose on the outside of Koto's left, so he swings it around and down for an underhand belt grab. Koto drops his arm down to defend it, but unlike a lot of guys who would hold position here, he does this while pushing forward. Hoshoryu hasn't made a move like a step back for a throw that would give up this ground. Kotonawaka is taking it. Hoshoryu does get that underhand belt grab when Koto gets his arm in around Hoshoryu's back, but Kotonawaka is such a big boy that this is not really a bad position for him. Hoshoryu drives forward, gaining about a half step of ground, then another step. Kotonawaka has his butt down and his feet wide. This could make him vulnerable to a push if Hoshoryu had his hands inside, but with both arms outside and both hands on Koto's belt, that's not really a concern. This is a great defensive stance against a double grip because even though it gives Hoshoryu options, it's going to be really hard to move Koto without committing hard to one of those options. Kotonawaka just has to be confident he'll react in time to whatever Hoshoryu does. The thing that ends up doing Hoshoryu in is his feet. Look at how far forward his right foot is. These guys can't see each other's feet, which is why we sometimes see wrestlers slowly shift from having one foot forward to the other without the opponent seeming to notice. But Hoshoryu's feet are almost perpendicular to Kotonawaka's, and Koto's going to notice that. The upshot of this stance is that Hoshoryu is positioned to throw to his left, and if he wants to use the belt for a throw, that's going to be tough with his right arm wrapped around the outside of Kotonawaka's left. 
He could do it from that position against a decent number of wrestlers, but Kota Nawaka is big enough to make that difficult on top of his high-level skill set. Hoshoryu goes for it, pulling his right hand back and jamming his arm inside for a belt grip he can use to actually hit a throw. If you're wondering why I spoke like I knew what Kota Nawaka was thinking, here's why. It takes 15 frames, one half of one second, from the time Hoshoryu releases the belt for Kota Nawaka to not only pinch his arm in defense, but also start driving forward. If Kota Nawaka wasn't ready for this, he could probably still defend it, but he wouldn't start the push that quickly. It doesn't even matter that Hoshoryu gets the belt. He would beat a lot of guys even in this position, braced on the rope with his right leg ready to kick back and pop Kota Nawaka's left in the air, just like he did against Hirata Umi. But Kota Nawaka gets some lift on Hoshoryu's belt, pushes through it, and even though Hoshoryu does a pretty incredible job maintaining his position on the rope for as long as he does, Kota Nawaka's got him. Hoshoryu wasn't perfect in the Nishikigi loss, but the slip affected things. Here it's easier to see what makes him so tough to beat and how that covers what weaknesses still exist in his game. He's just over 300 pounds, so he's really no bigger than a mid-sized Rikishi, but that masks how bonkers strong he's become over the last couple of years. There are not a lot of guys who can bring the same level of physicality to bear, and there may be no one except maybe Kirishima with the same blend of power, footwork, and general athleticism. When I point out the times that he knows exactly what to do against a given opponent and follows the appropriate strategy automatically, part of why he's able to do that is because, except against a Terno Fuji that we'll probably never see again, he doesn't have to worry about doing the right thing and still getting overwhelmed. He's confident that what he does will work with good reason, but it also means he can get caught out by someone working at a high enough level if they're able to solidly defend whatever he's doing because he still commits in a way that can get him in trouble if it doesn't work. There are just fewer and fewer guys who can punish those moments when they happen, but Kota Nawaka is one of those guys. Tamawashi starts with a decent push off the Tachiai, but it's no secret he's much easier to deal with if you can beat his aggression and make him react to your attack. It's just a question of which guys can do that to him. Hoshoryu, being one of them, weathers the initial storm and gets inside. The moment Tamawashi starts stepping back, it's basically over. It might not be against other wrestlers, but Hoshoryu has the strength and control to never let Tamawashi create the space necessary to restart his attack. This is not much different from their 2022 fight. It just covered more of the ring. Hokuto Fuji smartly takes off a moment before Hoshoryu touches, giving himself an extra split second to strike on the Tachiai. Hoshoryu smartly steps left to reduce the impact of Captain Faceplant planting his face on his chest. Hokuto Fuji does a good job staying under control as they pivot, which is something he's had issues with in the past. He doesn't get an advantage out of it though. This is a very even, neutral position. He steps in with a big left-handed shove, and Hoshoryu tries to parry it coming in like he did against Shodai. He does land the parry, but not before the push straightens him up enough to let Hokuto Fuji get priority on the attack. He's already diving in again while Hoshoryu recovers. Another thing that gets Hokuto Fuji in trouble sometimes is his big arm windmills that take too long to get to the target, but in this case, once it's back around and in position to strike, Hoshoryu is still twisted to the left and not able to beat him to the punch. Hokuto Fuji lands a solid push that Hoshoryu doesn't parry, and his left arm doesn't windmill. It's right there for a follow-up. Hokuto Fuji uses his next push to hop back a step away from the belt grab. When he leaves his hand on the shoulder, Hoshoryu immediately bats it down, hops right to work on getting space, and threatens the belt again. It's hard to say if Hokuto Fuji knew he would be in huge trouble if Hoshoryu escaped here, or if he was just doing Hokuto Fuji things, but he throws everything into one more push. If Hoshoryu's foot had hit the Tawara, as he clearly intended, maybe he survives the attack, but it didn't, and down he goes. This is like the Nishikigi fight in that he got finished off by an unfortunate misstep at the end, but unlike that fight, he was never in control here. It's important to remember though, that that's how a Hokuto Fuji fight often goes. He doesn't let people get control of the fight. He barrels at them until he wins or they figure out how to beat him. So that part's not really an indictment of Hoshoryu here. It's just a surprise that he wasn't able to escape and find that win. Ready for a long fight with almost nothing to discuss? Here we go! Kiri gets the jump, as basically everyone who pays attention does against Hoshoryu, and strikes first with his right hand. 
Hoshoryu turns this into a pretty brilliant move. He lets the strike push him more quickly into his pivot to the right, where he instantly snatches Kiri's belt. Even better, Kiri staggers past Hoshoryu because he absolutely did not expect this quick swivel, and Hoshoryu ends up with what we might call Sumo's version of side control. He wraps up Kiri's left arm and swings him around for a little do si -do, but eventually Kiri gets the underhand belt grip and brings the ride to a halt. In this position, Hoshoryu has all the leverage. Kiri can defend himself, but he has no angle of attack. Hoshoryu is the only one that can reasonably push, attempt a throw, or do anything else offensive. Kiri's left arm is completely trapped as long as he clings to the belt, and if he lets go, he has zero control, and Hoshoryu can do whatever he wants. So, Kiri has to work his way into a better position somehow before he can do anything useful. But as the fight continues, Hoshoryu absolutely refuses to budge off Kiri's left shoulder. Yeah, they shift in relative position a little bit, but every time Kiri tries anything, Hoshoryu grinds inside and doesn't give Kiri any space to work. The prodigal nephew is locked in and perfectly happy to leave Kiri with no options while he figures out what to do next. Eventually, Kiri hangs on to his dream of a one-armed head pull for too long and can't keep his feet set well enough defensively as Hoshoryu rotates around him. Hoshoryu doesn't miss the chance and drives him out for the Yori Kiri win. Okay, look, this is a glorious hank up, big air and everything, but people need to stop trying this on Hoshoryu. It's very much to Wakamoto Haru's credit that he recovers rather than getting insta yeeted, but he never gets set, which means he never solidifies his defense against the Kotanage that Hoshoryu loves to hit him with. Sure, Waka could try that Henka against a lot of people and still win if it didn't work, but he knew who he was doing it to here. It was a strategic blunder and Hoshoryu capitalized. Simple as that. The Nephew Against the Baby Miyagino trained the kid well on his Tachiai timing and he gets in quickly and solidly. Hoshoryu gets him going back a bit and the kid sidesteps left. This isn't a surprise, he likes to stay in motion, and he generally does a better job with it than someone like Shodai, who just has happy feet that won't stay still. Thing is, if people know you like to stay on the move, that means they know there will be moments where you're not planted and easier to manipulate. Here, Hakuoho takes one step, and when he goes into the second, Hoshoryu immediately twists and slips his left arm free to go for the belt throw. I don't know if he predicted it would work quite so well, but he's able to drag Hakuoho close enough to get his right ankle under the kid's left and trip him up. Hakuoho's left shoulder was clearly very bothersome at this point, but it doesn't look like it had anything to do with this outcome. Hoshoryu just timed his movement and hit the throw. Odds are, if this hadn't sent Hakuoho down, it would have off-balanced him enough for Hoshoryu to pounce and find another way to win pretty quickly. Hoshoryu doesn't play with any immediate step-offs on the run back. He takes whatever contact Hokuto Fuji can dish out and stays tight. And look how much trouble this gives Hokuto Fuji. This is a guy who wants to push and hit, but his hands are just flailing around. Bear in mind, this isn't necessarily the worst thing. Hokuto Fuji has definitely been guilty of trying to hit people so aggressively, almost mindlessly, that it makes him easier to defend against. If he's keeping his hands in because he's waiting for the right target, that's likely the right approach. But this is still better for Hoshoryu than getting pounded like in their previous fight. After they pivot, Hokuto Fuji finally finds good purchase with his left hand on Hoshoryu's shoulder and his right under Hoshoryu's arm. However, this is what guys at the top of the sport need to be able to do, match or beat specialists at their own game. There is absolutely nothing wrong with what Hokuto Fuji is doing here. Hoshoryu just isn't moving. When Hoshoryu plants his left hand under Hokuto Fuji's right elbow, even though Hokuto Fuji's arm is bent and should be hard to move, he snaps it back like he has no intention of being a sitting duck for a slapdown or a parry. He disconnects, lowers his body, and comes back in again, but it's a feint. Hokuto Fuji jams his hands high, exactly the way he would for a big push, but instead slips him around Hoshoryu's head and shoulder. The goal here is to make Hoshoryu react by leaning forward, into the strike and push that appear to be incoming. Unfortunately, Hoshoryu doesn't really bite, and Hokuto Fuji even appears to have undermined himself somewhat with contact that pushes Hoshoryu's head and shoulders back a bit, but he's committed to the move and runs with it. Hoshoryu goes absolutely nowhere, follows Hokuto Fuji with a push of his own, and sends him out. 
In the moment, it looked like an insane tactic from Hokuto Fuji because it didn't come anywhere near working. And Hoshoryu's balance is good enough that, even though he can get beat with that move, it needs to be set up, not purely launched as a sneak attack. But, with everything on the line and knowing Hoshoryu was fully aware he would almost certainly go bowling for judges, Hokuto Fuji decided the opposite approach might be the key. It was almost certainly not the best idea, but it was not as absurd as it ended up looking. So, looking at Hoshoryu's Yusho, this is what we find. 13 wins. 8 wins where he wasn't especially challenged or his strategy worked as intended, often, but not always, against inferior competition. 2 wins mostly through physical superiority against someone who would have beaten plenty of other wrestlers in a similar position. 1 win where he had control, then got himself in trouble for a moment but came back. 1 win against a guy who foolishly tried to henka and never got settled. And 1 win where he just didn't win. 3 losses. Two against opponents he should normally beat, but where he wound up in an unfavorable position and slipped before we found out if he could come back, and one against an opponent who came in with a plan and read him like a book. When I started this breakdown, I expected to see the evolution of a wrestler from talented but flawed to more well-rounded and smarter in his approach. To a certain degree, that is true. He's absolutely improved, especially in terms of reducing mistakes. He didn't make any blunders in the 2023 Basho like missing slapdowns or anything like that. But this is a guy whose improvement appears more physical than skill-based. He no longer has matches where his talent is matched against an opponent's superior size and power. He might be the smaller guy much of the time, but there's hardly anyone clearly stronger than him, and I don't mean only relative to size. He essentially never has to worry that he can do everything right against an opponent and still lose due to inferior strength, footwork, athleticism, whatever. I realize that may sound like I'm demeaning his improvements. We, as sports fans, have a tendency to laud the highly skilled more than the physically gifted. The skills take clear time and effort to build, whereas physical ability is to some degree good genes on top of the necessary hard work. But building the physical tools to hit this new level is a real accomplishment. And, critically, being the kind of athlete that works at a high level in all areas, as strong as all but the strongest guys, as mobile as all but the fastest guys, etc., is necessary for becoming the kind of champion we think of when we picture a Yokozuna. However, now that his physical tool set is sufficient to match up well against basically everyone, it's time to go from cleaning up the mistakes in his game to mastering as many different ways of finding victory as possible. To use an MMA analogy, right now, he's Ronda Rousey, blasting almost everyone with the skills at hand and the physical dominance to make it consistently work. Now he needs to become John Jones, the same physical dominance, but with a constantly growing tool set that allows him to stay ahead of the curve. Hopefully Uncle Asashore you will make sure he doesn't sit back on what he has like Rousey did, a time bomb waiting for the right wrestler to come along and blow up what looks like an inevitable reign at the top of the sport. Just to make sure it's said, the level of competition in Nagoya 2023 was definitely not as high as in 2022. No relatively healthy Terana Fuji, no Takakesho, no Waka Takakage. Given Kirishima's injury, Kota Nawaka was far and away the best wrestler Hoshoryu faced, and he lost that match. So it could be that he has more tools in his kit than he had need or opportunity to show, but if that was the case, it's hard to see him getting into a bad position against Nishikigi that led to a slip, or getting in a whole mess of trouble against Tobizaru despite his initial control. If he keeps building his skill set, in two years, this past July might look like amateur hour. Learning happens at different speeds for different people, so I don't want to claim Hoshoryu needs to win in September, or at least one Basho before 2024, or something in a very short time window. Instead, I'll finish not with a prediction, but with this simple statement. If Hoshoryu is going to become what his fans, and especially his supporters within the sumo community, believe he can become, he'll win at least four Yu shows by the end of 2025. That's four of the next 14. Even in an era of substantial parity and the regular sight of underranked Maegashira wrestlers dominating their way into contention, that should be well within his capabilities. Alright, thanks for watching this big, big breakdown of Hoshoryu 2022 versus Hoshoryu 2023. Have a great time watching the Basho, and I will see you soon.